John Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. Everybody and welcome back. Before we get into the episode, just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast, and all that means is that we are way behind where I'm at in Patreon. So if you are loving this podcast and you need more John Constantine in your life, definitely go check us out at patreoncom slash and comic books and sign up for the Hellblazer tier, where you'll get access to the entire Hellblazer library that I've recorded so far, and also you get access to the exclusive episodes of the Planes, Trains, and Comic Books main podcast. So if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we are reading Hellblazer number 35. And just a little catch up on what happened last issue, John Constantine has stumbled back into the lives of two friends we've seen before in past issues, and they are Marge and Mercury, and Marge is the mother of Mercury, and they are a couple of travelers who go around in a camper, and they don't really have any fixed address, which is why John didn't really know where they were after the Fear Machine story arc. But John has been able to find them after kind of running into another person that knew them, and he is not in a good place right now. He came to them all drunk and high on some kind of drugs, and he was basically just looking for Marge to sleep with him. And she definitely did not want to, uh, but John was able to talk to her, and eventually she kind of wore down and gave in to him. And while him and Marge were talking in the camper, Mercury was outside and she is a psychic. So she was feeling everything emotionally that was going on in the camper. And she was very upset by this. She was angry at Marge for giving in to him and not being strong enough to tell John no and push him away. And she was mad at John for coming to them in that state and bringing himself and his problems back into their life. So while she was sitting outside, dwelling on all these emotions she was getting from John, she felt a hand on her shoulder, and when she turned around, she saw like an apparition of a boy, John Constantine. And he definitely had like an evil look on his face, so this boy version of John definitely does not have good intentions. And that is where we left off with issue 34. So first things first, with issue 35, we got the cover here. There was a large square box with a black heart in it, and inside that black heart is a window where we can see the face of a young boy who has a big red heart on his forehead. And this kid doesn't look that sinister, but he definitely doesn't look happy either. And we see the writer of this issue is Jamie Delano with art by Sean Phillips. And I don't say this that often, but the cover date on this is November 1990. So we're definitely in the 90s now. And on the first page, we see John Constantine. He is playing Walk the Plank with some figurines of pirates and Native Americans. And one of the pirates that John calls Captain Death is forcing a Native American off the plank into a fish tank and John is watching as the Native American falls into the water and sinks to his death. And John's face in this kind of looks creepy. He kind of looks like Sid from the Toy Story movie. And we also see the name of this issue is called Dead Boy's Heart. And we also see that this issue takes place in the year 1961, where John is a young boy and he is living with his aunt and uncle. And John doesn't know why they're here. He thinks that their dad is away on a work trip, but it's definitely not that because everybody seems to have some more knowledge about it than John does. So besides the aunt, uncle, and John, his sister Cheryl, who we've seen before grown up in, I think like issue three of this series where her daughter was abducted by a serial killer. She is also living here and she is a teenager who's, you know, just trying to live a normal life. But of course, she's having to adjust and learn to live with her aunt and uncle as well. So apparently the grownups are out and John is bothering his sister and Cheryl is putting up with him, but she's just trying to get him out of the house. She, of course, is trying to have boys over without the adults there. So she's trying to bribe John with some kind of candy and saying that she will give him a shilling if he leaves. But John is not listening. He is definitely a weird kid. He is focusing on the fact that the year is 1961, and that is a very rare year because you can turn it backwards and upside down, and the numbers will read the same way. And he's saying the last time that happened was in 1881, and the next time that will happen is the year 6009. And while Cheryl's trying to bribe him, he is just focused on this number. 
He goes over to her dressing mirror and begins to use her lipstick to write out and do the math for how many heartbeats he will have to have had by the year 6009. And in this exchange, we can kind of see that John is obviously a very smart kid because he's doing high level multiplication. And he's also kind of obsessed with death because he's talking about his heartbeats. And then his sister Cheryl says that he'll be dead and buried by then. And this concept of heartbeats kind of goes through this issue. So John leaves Cheryl's room for a bit while he's thinking about this. And then he comes back in and he catches Cheryl practicing kissing on the mirror that he wrote that math on. And this scares Cheryl. And she says that, you know, he'll be the death of her. And this puts him on some like weird thought process where he's saying, yeah, dead, like mom, all moldy and rotten. Oh no, I won't. I'm going to be a lost boy and live in never, never land. And then he takes Cheryl's lipstick and draws some like war paint markings on his face. And with that, he agrees to finally leave. And he ends up at a quarry that is abandoned. And the narration says, the abandoned quarry's out of bounds. Get caught and it's a certain belting but it's the only interesting place in this boring village. Old machineries like robot dinosaurs guarding a flooded entrance to another world. The village kids say it's bottomless, full of iron spikes and tangled wire to drown you. But if a small kid could hold his breath for long enough, perhaps he could swim right through to Never Never Land. You'd have to get past the boogeyman though. He's dangerous. The village kids rattle his hut with stones and he goes crackers but a good tracker could get by. So what John's talking about here is he's going through a fence that has been cut, that is surrounding a quarry that has been abandoned. It is full of water. And at the bottom of it, by the water, there is a shed that is broken down and dilapidated. So as John enters through the hole in the gate, he runs into some older teenage kids that are smoking and hanging out here. And they see John and they try to like hassle him, but he's trying to act tough. He's got his war paint on and he also has a feather that is stuck to his head with a piece of twine. So it seems like he's trying to play like Indians. And the boys say, Oi, we got a trespasser here. What are you doing here, you little bastard? And John yells back, Nothing, I ain't a bastard. And the biggest kid out of these teenagers goes over to John and starts poking him in the chest with a stick and says, Yes, you are. You ain't got a mom. And dad is locked up for wagging scanties off a washing line. So obviously they're speaking in like Cockney here, but I'm trying to like translate it a little bit. Basically, they're revealing to John that his dad has been arrested and is not away on a work trip. He has in fact been arrested and is in jail for stealing a woman's panties off their clothesline. And John tries to act tough and deny this. He says, he ain't. He's working on on rockets at Cape Canaveral. But the kid poking him in the chest with a stick knows that's not true. And he says, liar, your Uncle Harry told our dad in the pub. And John doesn't really know what to say to this. So he just blurts out, I, I want to be in your gang. And the teenagers kind of laugh at this and they say, you ain't got the guts to do what we do. Ever kill the slimy eel with your teeth? Ever touched a girl's thing? And John is still trying to keep his bravado going and maintain his act of the Native American warrior. So he says that he's good at tracking and sneaking and spying. So the teenagers who are kind of playing along and they tell John to go down to the bottom of the quarry to the dilapidated shack where apparently a man they call the boogeyman keeps his dirty magazines. So they want John to sneak in there and steal some of those magazines and bring it back to them. And then they will let him join the gang. So John, of course, acting tough, says he'll do it. And he begins sneaking down to the shack as they yell after him. And if he catches you, he'll drown you and he'll bury your corpse in the bushes. That's what he does to kids. And as John begins his stealthy descent into this quarry, we get some narration. It says, this is a piece of piss. Just think it out. No mistakes. Down. Move from bush to bush. Watch out for loose rocks, dry twigs. You're a ghost, a shadow, invisible. Heart thumping like war drums, though. What if he can hear it? No fear. Warriors show no fear slowly carefully and he makes it all the way down to the shed and he can even see the magazines as he approaches through some broken boards on the side of it and the narration says here they are damp rotten smell it must be him easy does it just take one i wonder where he gets them from and before he can finish his thoughts of course the teenage boys weren't going to let him get that close without doing something so they begin throwing rocks at the roof of the shed and this wakes up the local homeless man who these teenagers call the boogeyman. And he runs out screaming, why don't you freaking kids leave me alone? And he sees John and immediately goes after him. But John is able to get away and hide in some bushes. Unfortunately, those bushes are what the homeless man uses as his restroom. So as John gets in these bushes, the narration says, 
Dark, musty smell. Ugh, shit's everywhere under crumpled nudie books. Is he still coming? And John, not knowing what to do, just decides to wait. He's like, I'm just going to wait here. I'm going to be as quiet as possible. I'm going to hold my breath and count my heartbeats. So John waits for a bit and the man goes away. But the narration says, hold your breath. Only the buzzing of flies and a distant blackbird chirping alarm. Has he given up or is it a trap? Wait. 1,000. Heartbeats slowing down now. How many till it's safe to come out? 1,500? No, more. Keep counting. So while he's thinking this, he notices something in the ground by his feet. And he registers that they are bones. And he's kind of thinking like maybe it's a fossil or a dinosaur or a pilot that crashed in the war. Stuff that kids would think. And he even says he's going to approach it like an archaeologist. So he begins to brush away the earth from the bones gently. And he's thinking, oh, maybe it's the missing link. And then he realizes that this is the skeleton of a body. The narration says... There's hips and a whole rib cage, part of an arm, but no skull. It's a little bit smaller than me. It's a dead boy, drowned and buried by the boogeyman, just like the village kids said. And as he looks harder at the rib cage, he sees something in the middle of it. So he reaches inside of it and he pulls out a rock. But because it was in the center of the rib cage, he assumes it's something else. The narration says, something gleaming dully in his chest. A stone, dig it out. Was this earth flesh? But a stone with veins... Look at the shape. Jesus, it's a fossil of the dead boy's heart. So John pulls this rock out and is staring at it, thinking it is an actual, like, fossilized heart. And he stares at it a while because the narration says, Another 3,600 heartbeats. Time to escape now. The Mohican has received a warrior's gift. Its magic will protect him from the boogeyman. Cold weight beating against chest. Death riding in pocket. So he's in like full fantasy mode now. He's thinking this thing is like a magical amulet or something. And he's still playing Native American warrior. And as he sneaks through the bushes back up the quarry hill, he sees the teenagers from before, but they have you know lost interest in him and have forgotten. And they have moved on to something else. They have captured a kitten and they're debating whether they should throw a rock at it or tie it in a bag and throw it in the water or set it on fire and let it run away. And as John goes a different path to try to avoid them, he accidentally runs into a couple who are in the process of undressing and the guy's been kind of forceful about it. The woman's skirt is hiked up and her shirt is off so her bra is exposed. And she's saying, ah, you're too rough, Keith. You're hurting me. And the man says, keep still, you bloody cow. I can't bloody undo it. I guess he's trying to undo her bra and he just can't get it. So as she's protesting, she looks behind Keith and sees John just staring at them from the bush. And she's like, oh my God, it's a kid. And immediately Kith tells John to sod off and stands up to scare John away. But weirdly, the woman stands up and is like, oh, don't, he's cute. He's going to rescue me from the nasty, hairy man. Leave him, Keith, let him watch. And then she walks towards John and has her hands around her breasts, kind of pushing them up and at John. And she says, you'd like that, wouldn't you, darling? Get your heart beating, huh? And this, of course, just terrifies John, and he runs the opposite direction back towards the teenagers. And this time they see him, so they catch him, and they're not letting him pass. And they're making fun of him, saying, Oi, look at this, lads. The great scouse scout bawling his eyes out. What's the matter, dum-dums? Get lost in the spooky quarry, then? Did the boogeyman make you shit your pants? And John gets mad at this, and he says, Let me pass, traitors. And the teenager who was poking John in the stomach earlier with a stick is not happy about being called a traitor. So he grabs John by the shirt, and he sees that John has a rolled-up pornography magazine in his shirt. So, of course, he takes it, and John really is only caring about the rock that he found, the dead boy's heart that he thinks is a magical totem. And the boys get distracted for a second as they look at the magazine, and this magazine is definitely not normal pornography. The boys are saying, look at that, a cat with its throat cut. Must be foreign, this. You only get tits in British books, our dad says. And then they refocus on John and they see that there's a lump in his pocket. So they go over there to try to get whatever is in his pocket out. And John begins swearing at them as they approach him. He says, bloody sodden bastard shits. No, but they are able to overpower him. And as they try to reach into his pocket, John is able to get there first. And he pulls the rock out and hits the biggest boy in the head with it. And the teenagers are about to attack him for this, but John starts going crazy and saying that, you know, he's a a Native American and he's going to kill the Blackfeet 
which is what John is calling them because he's imagining that they're some kind of rival native tribe. So instead of beating him up, they just throw beer cans at him and other trash from the area and yell mad boy at him. Then we cut to the evening where John is in his bed in his aunt and uncle's house and he's angry about the events that happened today and he's also angry because apparently when his aunt and uncle got home and he wasn't there, Cheryl just said that John had snuck out on his own. So John ended up getting spanked with a belt by his uncle. So he's just staring up at the ceiling kind of thinking about today's events and he's sucking on his thumb and he's grasping this dead boy's heart as he calls it to his chest and the narration says nothing in the world is fair everyone's a shitbag mom's a shitbag for being dead dad's a shitbag for going to prison cheryl's a shitbag for saying i went out without asking and aunt dolly's a shitbag for believing her shitbag shitbag shitbags body aches with battle wounds nettle rash on legs and arms my ass is on fire from the beltings but warriors don't mind pain It ain't fair, though. Uncle Harry ain't got the right. He ain't our dad. Who's he to call people Auntie Christ or whatever it was? And he looked to hurt. You could see it in his eyes. Sinners must suffer punishment, he said. Retribution, justice. Ask your father. And then John hears some weird talking coming from the other side of the wall, which is his aunt and uncle's room. And his aunt is saying, no, Harry, please. Not that way. Not tonight. And as he's listening, he's clutching the dead boy's heart close to him, and he says, the heart makes it louder, slapping, a groan, a stifled gasp. Don't listen to her crying. Snuggle into the silence. Poor Aunt Dolly. She'd be good to cuddle. Soft, big arms wrapping around, warm. And John is just basically feeling utterly alone and doesn't know what to do, so he takes this dead boy's heart in his hand, and he kind of holds it up to the sky, and then he gets an idea to kind of rub it all over his body. And he's hoping that this will take away the pain. The narration says, slide it hard and smooth to rest over the blistered skin. Feel it soothing, soaking up the hurt. Lift it back to feel its weight pressing down, squeezing me backwards into dull, booming underwater sleep. So just having this rock and like pressing it against himself, he's able to calm down enough to fall asleep finally. But he is awoken later by a sound from the restroom. And he thinks it's Cheryl at first, possibly trying to run away. So he goes out there to try to confront her to make sure she doesn't leave without him. But he ends up finding his aunt with like a belt tied around her wrists. And she's trying to undo it with her mouth. And of course, John doesn't even know what he's looking at. He's very confused by the idea that the uncle is tying up the aunt. And he's thinking that maybe she's in trouble. She's being punished for something. Kind of like how he was punished earlier with the belt. So he goes back to his room. Like I said, he's very confused. The narration says, why does he tie her up? To stop her running away? Maybe she lets him hurt her, like them in the woods. Maybe that's what you're supposed to do. Maybe Cheryl knows. Maybe. And with that, he falls back asleep. And in the morning, he gets up and his aunt is cleaning the dishes and has made him breakfast. And he tries to talk to her and he kind of throws some hints that he knows something weird's happening because he asks if she's okay. But the aunt just kind of ignores that and doesn't really pick up on the fact that he's asking those questions for a reason. And then John asks his aunt if it's true that his dad is in prison for nicking ladies' smalls, he says, but stealing their underwear. And she asks where he heard that, and John says that he heard it from some kids who said they heard it from Uncle Harry in a bar. And she says he shouldn't fret over it, but John is perplexed by this idea. He says, but our dad's not stupid. If he was going to steal something, it'd be more valuable than old knickers. And the aunt kind of looks back at John with uh, like a sour face and says, Men do some strange things in this world, boy. Things only God and them understand. Maybe you'll see it clearer when you grow up. You'll be one of them then, you poor little sod. And then picking up on her sadness, John John pulls out the rock that is the dead boy's heart, as he calls it, and he shows it to her, and he says, It's magic. If you rub it on your bruises, it'll take away all your aches. You try. And the aunt is just super disgusted by this, and she's like, Ugh, get away with your grubbiness, you nasty little tyke. Anyway, I haven't got any bruises. I'm off to the church now. Your sister will be back soon to hang out the washing. Don't go out of the garden and get rid of that dirty stone. It'll have diseases. And as she's walking out, John is just fixated on the stone, staring at it. He's very golem-like with this stone. (laughs) He's got like a weird look in his eye and you can almost hear him saying, my precious. And he stares at it for a long time in the same way because the next panel, he's outside, but he's in the same position. So he was staring at it that intently for a while. 
And while he stares, the narration saying, How many times did your heart beat before the boogeyman caught you, dead boy? Did he drown you straight away, or did he keep you locked up waiting? Were you lonely? Were you scared? Didn't you have a mom or dad to rescue you? And what's the secret thing he showed you? Was it death? Was it the way to Never Neverland? Is that where you are now? Is it fun there? Is it exciting? And while he's staring intently at the rock, Cheryl is hanging up clothes on a clothesline, and she sees him, and she's like, what are you doing, John? And she kneels down next to him, thinking he's playing with, like, a castle that he's built, but what he's actually got in front of him is a prison, he calls it. It's basically a bunch of jars that he's dug into the ground that are full of bugs that he's caught. And Cheryl hasn't yet seen that there's bugs there, but John takes this time to ask her a question. He says, let's run away back to Liverpool, Cheryl. We could hide in the bomb sites till they let Dad go. But Cheryl isn't paying attention. She's looking at what she thinks is a sand castle, thinking that John is having a great time being a kid. And she says, is it a magic castle, John? Who lives there? Princesses and magicians? Or what's that moving? And John says, I told you, it's a prison for insects. That's the flies. They're locked up for sicking on people's food. And here's the ladybugs. And here's worms because they eat dead people. And he's just going on and on and on about how many different bugs he has and how he pulls off their wings and traps them in these jars. And Cheryl is just like, oh my God, that's horrid. Won't they starve? And John says, oh, they might. Or they might eat each other. Sometimes I let them out for exercise. But if they try to escape, I execute them with the dead boy's heart. And he takes the dead boy's heart rock and he smashes a spider with it. And then he holds it up and shows her the smashed remains on the bottom of the rock. And he says, I've done it lots. Look at the stains. If I do it enough, the dead boy will come back and show me the way to Never Never Land. And Cheryl is horrified by this. She says, you're nasty and bad, John Constantine. Let them go free. They're creatures with feelings. It's terrible, cruel, evil. You let them go or I'll tell on you. And then John turns to her with an evil face and says, so what if you do? I'll tell Uncle Harry how I seen you let your knickers down to Ron Simpson for one and six pence. And John is just lying here. She's never done that. So, of course, she's really angered by this, and she tells him that she hates him and runs away. And at that, John just takes his rock and begins to smash it down on the ground, saying, I don't care. Everyone does. And he continues to smash it down and down again into the ground. And eventually, he accidentally hits his finger, smashing it and causing it to bleed. And John actually takes his finger and holds it over the rock as it drips blood down onto it. And as he's doing this, the narration says, it's the dead boy's heart. Cheryl's right. It's cruel evil. It's magic, but it's bad. I shouldn't have took it away. What if he does come back looking for it? What if he wants to swap? And then he begins to stare at the rock again, and he thinks it looks different. He says, it's warm now, heavier with all the pain it's soaked up. It's sticky with insect juice and blood. And we're not really sure if it actually is heavier and bigger, or if that's just all in John's head. But upon seeing this and thinking it's bigger, it changes his mind about the rock. And the narration says, stop it. It's cursed. It's making you do bad things. Get rid of it. Take it back. So John leaves his backyard and walks all the way back to the quarry. And instead of taking it back to the bushes, because he obviously scared about the boogeyman, he decides to throw it from the top of the quarry down into the water. But unfortunately, he doesn't have a very good arm. (laughs) So when he throws it, It doesn't quite make it to the water. It actually arcs up, and as it comes down, it's very obvious it's going to hit the shed that the boogeyman lives in. And John, of course, is freaking out about this because he thinks the boogeyman's going to wake up and run out and try to get him again. But when the rock hits, it makes a different sound than before, and also the boogeyman doesn't run out. And the narration says, Tin roof, the sound. Oh, Jesus, it went straight through. It hit him, split his skull. His brains have splashed out and blood all over down his face like porridge and jam. He's dead, must be. I've killed the boogeyman. And horrified by this thought, John does what any normal kid would do, and he decides to run away. So he runs out of the quarry and back to his house, and the narration over this page says, Someone will find him while they're out walking their dog. They'll smell him. They'll see the maggots. They'll get me. They'll lock me up. They'll hang me. But nobody saw. Hands were sweaty, so there's no fingerprints. But they'll know. They'll see it in my eyes. Risk it. Sneak away. Cover your tracks. Maybe just tell Cheryl. She'll know what. No, not even her. You can never tell a living soul. It's the boogeyman's secret. It's the awful, lonely secret of the dead boy's heart. And you must keep it to your grave. But the very worst thing is, once you know it, you're a boogeyman too. And with that last box of narration, John is outside of the window of his aunt and uncle's house. 
and he's staring in at what looks like a very nice family of Cheryl and his aunt and uncle watching TV. And this is like a visual metaphor of him feeling like he's an outsider and an outcast. And that is the end of the issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.